I really hesitate to make predictions about where this investigation is going to go for a variety of obvious reasons, but then one very specific reason, which is the first six months of last year uh, when I was talking about this investigation and how it was unfolding, my literal example was, it's not like there's going to be an email from the Russians to Trump saying, we're the Russians and we would like to help you. <laughs> and it turns out that that email exists. <laughs> and that the president's son responded in capital letters, I love it, <laughs> and that the world has sort of gone on spinning. And so, uh, so, so I wanna say that sort of as a half joke and also a very half serious observation, which is uh, almost every stage of this has sort of turned out to be weirder than we could have imagined. It is my delight, pleasure to welcome my friend Garrett Graff to join us for a discussion today on Trump, Russia, and Bob Mueller. Garrett Should has... Should be short and not a lot to say. Yeah, short and boring, yeah. So uh, Garrett has his two most recent books. I think when he wrote them, he I'm not sure he understood the full purchase of them. Uh, the most recent one is called Raven Rock, and it is about the government's Cold War continuity plans in the event of a nuclear holocaust. And it is really, I highly recommend it. It is a great book, especially for any uh, uh, aficionados of, of, of Cold War history, but it suddenly has been remarkably relevant, I think, with all the uh, talk of North Korea's growing nuclear capability. His other book, uh, we're going to discuss at some length today, it's called The Threat, the Threat Matrix. And it's really a biography of Bob Mueller's tenure at the FBI for 12 years. And I highly recommend that one as well. Uh, Garrett, I think, unintentionally has spent the last, oh, 15 or 20 years uh, covering in copious detail the careers of Bob Mueller and James Comey. And I'm sure a year ago or two years ago, you thought that was... That was never going to have the, the spotlight it has today, making Garrett among the most sought after speakers and journalists of our uh, current moment. Uh, Garrett has spent more than a dozen years covering politics, technolo technology, and national security. He is a contributing editor at Wired and the director of the Aspen Institute's Cybersecurity and Technology Program. He has written for many major outlets, from Esquire to the New York Times. He served as the editor of Washingtonian Magazine and then Politico Magazine, where he led it to its first National Magazine Award. He is the chair of the board of the National Conference on Citizenship, a congressionally chartered civic engagement group founded by Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. Welcome, Garrett Graff. Thank you. So, uh, I'm going to start by asking you a question about uh, about Russia, and which is, you know, in your book, The Threat, Metri Threat Matrix, you really wrote about how the FBI had to change itself to deal with counterterrorism, to really be focused on terrorism on American soil. And, and I wonder if, to what extent, that incredible story of transformation maybe led to a blind spot on the Russia front. It's a good question. Um, thanks for having me, Nico. It's a pleasure to be back in uh, at the Shorenstein Center. Um, so, as you mentioned, uh, Bob Mueller led this really remarkable transformation of the FBI. Uh, he 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 started on September fourth, two thousand one. Um, as many people know now. Um, and he actually thought at that point uh, his job was going to be to fix the computers. He became the FBI director in the summer of 2001, uh, in part because he was a computer geek, um, which is sort of a little, under, uh, little known portion of Bob Mueller's history. He uh, 
the, working in the George H.W. Bush administration actually started the first computer crimes unit at the Justice Department. Then as uh, the U.S. attorney for San Francisco in the late 1990s got so frustrated with the U.S. attorney's uh, case management system that he designed his own, created it, uh, built it, and then that became the case management software for every U.S. attorney's office in the United States. And the FBI had this incredibly terrible and antiquated uh, computer system in, in 2000, 2001, where it, it was so bad, in fact, that as we, it, uh, during that sort of summer of 2001, during the moment where we now know uh, the FBI was chasing the 9-11 plot, but the FBI didn't know exactly what they were chasing. They just knew that there was sort of something going on that summer. Uh, at one point, in order to get a file from the LA field office to the New York field office, uh, an agent actually had to save the file to a floppy disk, get on a cross-country flight, fly to JFK, and hand it in person to a New York agent in order to continue the investigation. So that was sort of what Bob Mueller thought he was coming in to do. And he uh, started September 4th, 2001. Tuesday morning, September 11th, was seated in the FBI director's conference room on the seventh floor overlooking Pennsylvania Avenue and uh, was actually getting his first briefing on Al Qaeda and the investigation uh, into the bombing of US, the USS Cole, which had occurred the year before. And <laughs> someone interrupts uh, shortly uh, around 9 o'clock to say, a uh, plane has hit the World Trade Center. Um, and I, when I asked Mueller sort of what was your first reaction, he said, you know, I, actually, I, I looked out the window and anyone who's on the East Coast that day remembers uh, uh, how blue, blue how blue and clear the sky was. I was actually here uh, at Harvard in college, um, and he he said, "I wonder how a plane managed to hit the World Trade Center on such a clear day." Um, that sort of terrorism at that point was still sort of he he was literally sitting in a briefing on Al-Qaeda, and terrorism was still sort of such, so far removed from what the Bureau was thinking about at that moment, that that was his first reaction. Um, and then that leads to this sort of incredible uh, transformation that he leads uh, the FBI through, uh, really transforming it from a domestic law enforcement agency into an international intelligence agency. I mean, they pull thousands of agents off of uh, traditional criminal prosecutions um, actually pull, um, this is where I begin to circle around to actually answering the question that you asked. Um, <laughs> Uh, they pulled, you know, agents, analysts out of the counterintelligence side and sort of began to, uh, you know, just throw everything into, uh, into prosecuting the war on terror. And in fact, in, it's, in some ways, that was the right thing to do. I mean, it was sort of one of the things that we forget is how much of a friend Russia was and Vladimir Putin was on 9-11. The first call that President Bush received from a world leader was Vladimir Putin. The Russian government was involved that day in its own uh, Cold War style military exercises. And Putin says, uh, you know, this, this is in the 10 o'clock hour on September 11th, uh, Putin says, uh, we are grounding all of our forces for the rest of the day. You know, you don't have to worry about us. There's going to be nothing uh, going on. Every Russian military unit we are putting on the ground. And, uh, and so there was sort of this moment where we were actually very actively involved in cooperation, particularly on counterterrorism uh, with, with Russia, which has struggled with its own uh, Islamic extremism problems coming out of Chechnya and, and the Caucasus. Um, and then sort of you begin to see this shift as the counterterrorism world uh, wraps up. 
uh, or not wraps up, but uh, they sort of get uh, the system more in place later on in his tenure. And uh, Mueller ends up uh, overseeing in 2009 uh, Operation Ghost Stories, which is the largest counterintelligence investigation effectively since the end of the Cold War. Um, which we remember uh, effectively because they arrested one really attractive red-headed Russian spy, uh, Anna Chapman, uh, as well as a bunch of other people that we have all promptly forgotten. Um, but it was this, it was a really major shift in realizing uh, the extent to which Russia was still actively engaged in espionage operations inside the United States, that they had uh, pushed this network of uh, 10 illegals. This is the case that in, ultimately inspires the FX show of the Americans uh, into uh, sort of these deep cover identities inside the United States. Uh, and uh, that sort of kicks off a very active era of Russian operations against the United States, including uh, one that sort of Mueller oversaw right at the end of his tenure uh, the beginning of a case that would ultimately uh, wrap up what uh, someone that was originally known as unidentified male number one uh, in the indictment of three Russian SVR agents, the SVR being the Foreign Intelligence Agency, roughly equivalent to the CIA in the Russian system. And uh, the FBI uh, in... Uh, 2013, 2014, uh, and uh, right at the beginning of 2015, runs actually one of its most successful counterintelligence operations uh, in a number of years, actually run by the same agent who helped lead the, uh, the Ghost Stories Illegals case, this uh, amazing woman uh, in New York, um, where the FBI actually manages to hide recording devices inside binders that they convince the Russian intelligence officers to take into their secure conference room in the residentura of the UN mission in New York mm -hmm. and record this these incredibly uh, colorful and candid comments that the Russian intelligence officers are making to each other um, in uh, about one of the people that they are trying to recruit as an intelligent asset who in the indictment in January 2014, uh, 2015 is listed only as unidentified male number one, who we now know as a uh, Carter Page. Um, <laughs> and that these two Russian SVR agents, uh, Viktor Podobny and Igor Sporyashev, uh, are uh, trying to recruit this uh, energy consultant to be a intelligence asset uh, for, for Russia. Um, and uh, ultimately determine that he is too scatterbrained and, and stupid is actually the word that they use to uh, be an effective asset. And so, uh, and, and I'm sort of dropping him as an asset, but that uh, puts unidentified male number one on the radar of the FBI from a counterintelligence perspective uh, that comes back around uh, later in a FISA application that is now America's most famous FISA application. <laughs> um, and I think that the ultimate long-winded answer to your question is the, uh, the, the FBI and the country overall, not just the FBI, but sort of the intelligence community writ large, uh, really did underestimate the Russian threat uh, and the level of active, uh, uh, what the what the Russians call active measures uh, that they were willing to deploy against the United States, uh, and, and you sort of see a, a massive failure of imagination over the course of 2015 and 2016 to put together these pieces uh, as they're unfolding inside the Situation Room, inside the intelligence community, uh, because we just weren't expecting it. Hmm. Uh to change course a little bit here, I want to talk a little more about uh, about Mueller. You know, in in your book, the threat met, threat matrix, you really describe him as 
I don't know how to say it, but like an institutionalist, mm -hmm. almost. He's a man who, the portrait you paint, he comes across as a man who deeply believes in institutions. And when they try and split, when, 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 the, when, when there's a movement among um, the 9-11 the Commission and others to recommend splitting the FBI into counterterrorism and law enforcement, mm -hmm. Uh, Mueller really advocates very strongly and succeeds in keeping the FBI together because of the norms and institutional culture of the, the FBI and its relationship to local law enforcement. And, and, and that seems so contrary to the president of the United States, who is almost like an anti-institutionalist. And I just wondered how that, I wondered, did you just talk a little bit about that contrast between those two personalities, their histories, their values, and what they see as essentially American. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And and to me, it is uh, almost Shakespearean uh, the extent to which you now have these two people uh, pitted against each other in American politics uh, who, who started out from much the same place, um, you know, sort of... Uh, Northeastern uh, uh, establishment, uh, Ivy educated. Um, children of privilege. Children of privilege, only uh, two years apart in age. Um, and yet people who have effectively led uh, lives with a diametrically opposed set of values. And, and uh, Donald Trump, uh, who... I. I think it is fair to say, uh, has been very focused on uh, his personal brand uh, and self sort of, and, and self interest, and, and Mueller, uh, who has dedicated his life to public service in a way uh, that actually you don't see that much in American public life anymore. Um, this uh, he. Uh, graduated from college, graduated from Princeton, and volunteered to go to Vietnam. This was bef this was actually sort of early in the 1960s, before Vietnam becomes the cultural t uh, uh, touch point that it does later, uh, and was inspired uh, actually uh, to do that by the sacrifice of one of his Princeton classmates, David Hackett, who uh, joined the Marines, went to Vietnam, and was killed. Um, and Bob Mueller and a handful of his other colleagues actually then uh, were inspired to join um, uh, the Marines themselves. Um, he goes to Vietnam, uh, December 1968, uh, is involved in uh, uh, combat, uh, is ambushed by uh, as many as 200 uh, North Vietnamese troops. Uh, is pinned down uh, with his unit and leads uh, a team of his Marines uh, out uh, into enemy territory to bring back a mortally wounded comrade uh, and receives the Bronze Star with Valor. April 1969, uh, Muller is shot through the thigh in combat, uh, goes... Uh, uh, to uh, field hospital, uh, heals, goes sort of right back uh, to, to combat. Uh, during his uh, rest and recuperation time in Hawaii, he uh, meets up with his uh, then sort of newly married wife, Anne, um, and informs her that he wants to be a Marine for the rest of his career. Um, and uh, she informs him that that is not an option that is open to him uh, uh, in their marriage. And he comes back uh, and goes to law school and actually ap applies to immediately to work for the Department of Justice um, and is turned down uh, the first time. Um, and I, I sort of love the idea that sort of someone out there uh, looked at Bob Mueller's application to be a prosecutor and it was like, Nah, we can do better. Um, and uh, goes off into private practice, uh, reapplies, uh, becomes an assistant U.S. attorney, uh, first in San Francisco, later uh, in Boston, actually here, uh, under Bill Weld, 
uh, works his way up uh, to become acting U.S. attorney when Bill Weld leaves, is brought down to the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, uh, what they call Maine Justice in Washington under the George H.W. Bush administration under Attorney General Richard Thornburg. Uh, to head the criminal division, to uh, be the assistant attorney general for the criminal division. Uh, leads the prosecution of uh, Manuel Noriega, uh, bombing of Pan Am 103. Uh, leaves at the end of the George H.W. Bush administration, goes into private practice, uh, actually again with a Boston firm then known as Hale and Dorr, um, now Wilmer Hale. Uh, and spends about a year uh, really unhappily in private practice. Um, and I went back uh, and talked to a, a bunch of his colleagues from that era, and they sort of all have a version of the same story, which goes something like this, which is they would bring Bob Mueller in to meet with a new client, and Mueller would sort of sit there, listen to the client, uh, explain what was going on, and then Mueller would say something along the lines of, well, it sounds like you're, you should plead guilty and go to prison. <laughs> um, which uh, does, is not something that a lot of people are sort of looking for as the upfront <laughs> advice from their defense attorneys. And so Mueller ultimately uh, calls Eric Holder, uh, who was then the U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia, and asks to come back as a line homicide prosecutor, um, which in the U.S. government system is almost literally the equivalent of a three-star general retiring uh, and then re-enlisting again as a second lieutenant. Um, and Mueller sort of shows up uh, on the line at the Triple Nickel, the D.C. U.S. attorney's office, uh, working homicide and alongside people sort of two, three, four years out of law school um, after he had led the entire criminal division for the United States Department of Justice nationwide and sort of works his way over the course of the 1990s uh, back up through the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, becomes uh, the U.S. Attorney for San Francisco uh, under Bill Clinton is uh, then brought back to Washington uh, by George W. Bush as the acting deputy attorney general, um, which, which, remember, uh, is an incredibly important post, but for most of American history has been a relatively anonymous one. There was actually a time in American history where we didn't wake up every morning and check Twitter to see if the deputy attorney general still had a job. So this was sort of uh, an incredibly important job uh, that you know meant a great deal in the Department of Justice, but was largely unknown before then, uh, you know, to the rest of the country. And then becomes uh, the FBI director in the summer of 2001. And I would ask Mueller uh, when he was a, uh, sort of wrapping up his time at the FBI, um, you know, what are you going to do next? Uh, and he would always point down Pennsylvania Avenue, and he'd said, I'm going back to homicide. <laughs> wow. Uh, but, but he just, he really, his life has been about public service, right? Like, how, how do you, uh, well, maybe the way to ask this question is, what do you think, when you w watch all the media coverage of, Mueller and and the Russia investigation and you know knowing as intimately as you do Mueller and Comey what do you think the media's blind spots are in covering this story It's a really good question um, so I think I'm going to answer a slightly different okay. question because I don't know that I actually have a, a great answer uh, for the question that you asked, um, uh, which is the thing that is most interesting to me about watching Bob Mueller uh, do this investigation is how little we actually know about what Bob Mueller is doing. 
um, which is this is the this is the most carefully covered investigation in American history. You know, this what do you, what is do you mean carefully covered. Uh, well, uh, on any given day, there are approximately three thousand journalists in Washington desperately trying to find any tiny scrap of new information. Uh, there are dozens of defense attorneys for all sorts of different clients with different equities and different expectations who are trying to spin this story one way or another. You have two uh, very intense, very high profile congressional investigations uh, unfolding at the same time, uh, very publicly in, in the spotlight. And every step of Bob Mueller's investigation that has become public, we have been surprised to know how much further along Bob Mueller is than we think that he is. How much more he knows and how much uh, more, uh, uh, sort of more expansive it is than we have been expecting. Um, you know, in the midst of this, you know, political microscope, uh, Bob Mueller uh, arrested George Papadopoulos, uh, got him to cooperate, uh, and had him plead guilty uh, without anyone in Washington realizing he was even on stage, uh, that he was sort of even a player in the investigation at that point. Um, and, you know, even we, it just even in the last couple of weeks, you know, we're, we're finding out uh, you know, days or weeks later from when he has interviewed uh, uh, Jim Comey himself, uh, that he's interviewed Jeff Sessions. Um, we know that there are at least two very significant pieces of evidence that Bob Mueller knows that we don't have any idea what they are, uh, which is the information that George Papadopoulos traded for his plea deal uh, and the information that Michael Flynn pleaded for or uh, traded for his plea deal. Um, Michael Flynn, by the way, sort of one of the things that's worth pointing out is that under sort of normal Justice Department procedure, uh, you don't get much benefit from, as they say, cooperating down, which is uh, sort of uh, providing information on people lower in a conspiracy than you are. Um, if you are the national security advisor at the White House, uh, there are probably only about five people in the world uh, that you could provide information to the Justice Department on uh, that they would consider cooperating up. Uh, and, and we don't have any idea what, the, what this is. Um, and, I, and I think it's tr a remarkable a a and a testament to Mueller as well as the team that he has assembled around him uh, that I think, uh, and, and I've actually spent a lot of time trying to press on this and trying to find where the seam is. Um, I don't know of a single journalist uh, that I've talked to uh, who can point to a leak that seems like it's attributable to Bob Mueller's team, um, which is remarkable uh, in and of itself. Um, and so sort of in the midst of this incredible stress, uh, Mueller is sort of keeping his head down. And he used to joke at the FBI, uh, it, well, I'll, I'll back up a step. It, he feels really grateful that he came back from Vietnam. Um, it, it changed and has sort of affected uh, his life uh, ever since, that he, he, unlike David Hackett, came back. Uh, and, and he feels sort of grateful and lucky for that. And, uh, and, and it, he has said that it has helped put sort of everything afterwards in perspective for him. Uh, and so sort of his joke in the FBI, uh, Mueller is actually an incredibly funny person. He has a great sense of humor, all public evidence to the contrary. <laughs> um, but sort of like much of sort of federal law enforcement or, or law enforcement or the intelligence community, there's a lot of sort of dark humor wrapped up in it. Uh, and so in the years after 9-11, sort of Mueller's joke behind closed doors was, well, I'm still getting more sleep than I got in Vietnam. 
<laughs> and I think that that's the way that Bob Mueller is probably looking at this investigation right now is, you know, it's incredibly tough. It's incredibly politicized. But Bob Mueller is going home at the end of the day and having more sleep, sleep than he got in Vietnam. What does he do for fun? Golf. Oh, he's a golfer. Um, he, he, is a, he is a very intense golfer. Um, his wife, Anne, is actually the better golfer. Um, uh, but he, uh, that is sort of his, uh, his main uh, hobby slash activity. You wrote a piece last week for Wired magazine uh, titled, Bob Mueller's investigation is larger and further along than you think. And when we were talking about it this morning, you said um, that everything in there had been reported already. It was kind of public knowledge. You would know it from reading the New York Times. And I guess when I asked you the question about the media's blind spots, I was thinking, well, maybe it had all been reported, but there's kind of an incrementalism in the reporting that misses the forest for the trees. And I just wondered to what extent you think that's, uh, the, in your experience covering the FBI and covering Mueller, is that always the case? Is that, is, that, is that a side product of the totally sealed nature of the team without leaks? What, what, is it the media environment? How do you think about that? Uh, well, I think, so I, I think you have a lot of different things happening at once in this. So one is, uh, you know, the media is doing all of its own investigations. Um, you know, actually, there was even reporting this morning about how BuzzFeed has a former FBI official out there trying to uh, confirm the Steele dossier independently from all of the other work that, that everyone else is doing because BuzzFeed is now wrapped up in this libel lawsuit um, over publishing the Steele dossier. And so there's sort of a, there are a lot of other avenues that, that various people are are, um, uh, are are pursuing and, and we talk of and this was sort of the the center of my piece last week is that we talk about Mueller the 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 Mueller probe as if it's sort of a single entity uh, but it's at least five different separate criminal probes uh, and w w that's sort of something that I think we, we have lost track of, um, which is, and certainly different parts of this overlap. Some of these, some players uh, factor into more than one part of this investigation. Uh, but you have uh, a distinct investigation and set of charges around past business deals and money laundering. This is the part of the investigation that has given rise to the charges against Paul Manafort and Rick Gates uh, for, for activity largely unrelated to the Trump campaign itself, but as sort of past business dealings with Russian and Ukrainian entities leading to this sort of vast $60 million decade-long money laundering scheme. Uh, there's also some money laundering investigation potentially going up uh, in, involved in that related to the Russian embassy. Um, BuzzFeed has actually done some really interesting reporting around a series of suspicious transactions by the Russian embassy, including a $140,000 uh, cash withdrawal that was attempted just after the election uh, that was reported by Citibank and flagged as suspicious. <coughs> Uh, because uh, the Russian embassy doesn't often uh, withdraw $140,000 in cash uh, from Is that, like the bank. at the ATM. At the, at the, at the when you click other um, <laughs> on the fast cash button, you and you get the $140,000 uh, option. Um, second is sort of what we call the hacking of the election is in fact two very distinct sets of Russian intelligence operations carried out by distinct Russian entities. So the second avenue of investigation are Russian information operations. This is sort of the Facebook, uh, Twitter bots and trolls, uh, the, the fake news push, the uh, data analytics work, voter targeting that was going on, largely driven by the quote unquote troll factory of the Internet Research Agency uh, in St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, 
third is a separate part of the hacking of the election, which is the active cyber intrusions, which were operations carried out by the Russian FSB and GRU, the hacking teams that we call in the West Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear, that were uh, that were sort of active attempts to penetrate and weaponize information stolen from the DNC, the DCCC, uh, Republican websites, also uh, uh, John Podesta's email, and then state level uh, voting infrastructure. Um, we now understand that Dutch intelligence, uh, so uh, for those of you who didn't know, the Dutch have an intelligence agency, um, was actually able to penetrate the network of the Cozy Bear hacking team, including uh, gain access to remotely a security camera uh, that monitored everyone coming in and out of the Cozy Bear offices. So Dutch intelligence was able to collect and turn over to the United States photographs of everyone involved on the Cozy Bear hacking team. And uh, according to the Wall Street Journal reporting, the US has uh, specifically identified at least six Russian intelligence uh, agents and officers uh, who were involved in those operations. Uh, if the Justice Department is consistent with what the National Security Division has been doing over the last decade, which is bringing criminal charges against identifiable intelligence officers from China, Iran, and Russia, we can expect that Mueller's investigation or the Department of Justice will end up charging those uh, Russian FSB or GRU officers. The fourth is the so thing just to be clear one money laundering and suspicious business transactions two russian information operations three cyber intrusions or actual real yep. hacking yep. four four is uh the suspicious russian campaign contacts um and this is the this is sort of the the weird milieu of uh, Russian nationals and Russian officials um, that involve everyone from sort of random entertainment lawyers to the head of the VEB Russian Development Bank, which, by the way, circling back around, is the same bank uh, that Yevgeny Buryakov was working for when he was arrested uh, as a Russian intelligence officer in New York in, as part of that earlier Carter Page case. Uh, the, he was working undercover in New York City as the deputy head of the VEB Bank's office in New York City, becomes the first Russian intelligence officer to go to prison in the United States in 50 to 75 years. And the head of that bank, Sergei Gorkov, is the person that uh, Jared Kushner uh, meets with privately at Trump Tower after the election. Uh, then obviously you have the contact with Russian ambassador Sergei Kislyak, uh, which is uh, what forces Jeff Sessions to recuse himself from this investigation and is uh, the center of the Mike Flynn's plea deal in terms of lying about his contact with Sergei Kislyak during the transition. Uh, and then fifth, uh, totally separate, uh, is, is sort of the big kahuna investigation, um, which is obstruction of justice, which uh, on a daily basis, we are effectively not talking about any of the first four of these investigations. Um, and this is the question of whether Donald Trump uh, or other aides at the White House either obstructed justice uh, by talking uh, by pressuring Jim Comey to look past the Michael Flynn investigation, and then when Comey did not, fired him. So I have a lot of questions. I, I, have, I have two more questions, and then I'll open it up. But my first question is, hearing all of that, you know, Masha Gessen, when she was here, uh, talked about the dangers of conspiracy thinking, that 
when you lay it out like that and all these pieces, it, it feels like a conspiracy, even if it's not. And, and I wondered how you, in your reporting, how you think about this and how you, and how you resist the urge to draw links that aren't there. So I think one of the reasons um, uh, that I, so, so um, uh, let me back up and, and say, uh, I really hesitate to make predictions about where this investigation is going to go for a variety of obvious reasons, but then one very specific reason, which is the first six months of last year uh, when I was talking about this investigation and how it was unfolding, my literal example was, it's not like there's going to be an email from the Russians to Trump saying, we're the Russians and we would like to help you. <laughs> and it turns out that that email exists. <laughs> And that the president's son responded in capital letters, I love it. <laughs> and that the world has sort of gone on spinning. And so, uh, so, so I want to say that sort of as a half joke and also a very half serious observation, which is uh, almost every stage of this has sort of turned out to be weirder than we <laughs> could have imagined. Um, but... I don't know that I have seen evidence that yet leads me to believe that on the Trump side, there was an active, engaged conspiracy. I think what you saw were a large number of uh, opportunistic individuals working uh, to advance their own agendas and their own power and business interests uh, in the midst of a, uh, and we all lived through this, so we know that this part is true, a uniquely chaotic and poorly organized campaign uh, structure. Uh, which is not to say that there was not on the Russian side, an active conspiracy to influence the intellig uh, to influence the Trump campaign as an intelligence operation, um, and, and I think that one of the things that really stands out to me in the course of looking at this as a big story is the extent to which we do not see and have not seen uh, routine, uh, innocent explanations for otherwise suspicious behavior. That sort of every data point that we see in this investigation uh, continues to point towards a relatively organized uh, effort on the Russian side to attempt to make contact with the Trump campaign, to assess their willingness to cooperate or participate in a partnership, and then a active decision uh, to begin aiding and providing weaponized information for the benefit of the Trump campaign against Hillary Clinton. Um, and what I mean by the sort of uh, routine exculpatory information is it, in most investigations, you see sort of all sorts of things that appear suspicious at first glance that upon further investigation are not. Um, why was Nico in the Charles Hotel you know, on that particular morning for breakfast. Oh, Nico eats breakfast there every Tuesday morning, and <laughs> and, Monday, and, and it just happens Tuesday. to have been the same day that sketchy Russian oligarch uh, <laughs> Boris was there as well. Um, you know, why was such and such in Trump Tower on that given day? Oh, you know, he gets his haircut there every Thursday. 
um, we just sort of don't see that. That sort of every every detail that comes out about this case uh, ends up sort of lining up into sort of a intelligence operation that was incredibly effective and went through distinct phases. Um, and, and and which has cost the Russians nothing so far. It, yeah, no. it, it, which has which uh, as far as the Russians are concerned has been effectively cost free. I, I mean, I, I or uh, consequence free. Uh, consequence free. Yes. Um, I, I, I and I said this in um, D December 2016 that I think we were going to look at Russia's attempt uh, to influence the 2016 election as the most successful intelligence operation in world history um but and it's, it's possible that could be true and no one broke the law it well it's it's possible that the trump campaign didn't realize that they were ever actively a part of this um i i think it is highly unlikely that no one broke the law um i, I think it is entirely possible that uh donald trump is sitting there saying I didn't collude with Russia, um, and and actively believes that. I think that, and and you and I were talking about this earlier. I think that sort of part of this challenge is also um, that the, the Democrats sort of falsely set expectations at the beginning of this um, in that collusion doesn't exist. It is not a criminal charge uh, that a prosecutor can bring. Um, so the charges are things like being an unregistered foreign agent, a FARA violation, um, a 1001 violation, lying to a federal agent, uh, you know, wire fraud, money fraud, or wi wire fraud, bank fraud, money laundering, conspiracy against the United States. Like, I think that there's sort of the, this false set of expectations, particularly uh, in uh, uh, certain cable channels uh, uh, that, you know, Donald Trump could be marched off to jail as an unregistered foreign agent of the Russian government, and Fox News would still be sitting there saying, see, they haven't convicted him of collusion. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of actually my final question, then we'll open it up, and uh, which is, given your earlier, when you talked about Mueller's trajectory and career, what do you think he thinks when he hears <laughs> Senator Ron Johnson or... Nunez or listens to Hannity and he's somehow become like a public enemy, a partisan public enemy. What do you make of that, both in terms of how Mueller must experience that, but also what happened? I mean, one of the stark things in the threat, ma threat matrix is A, you know, really how fundamentally conservative Mueller is but also be how respected he was mm -hmm. on both sides of the aisle. Yeah, I think, and I'm sure that there are people in this room who have had dealings with federal law enforcement uh, or the intelligence community. The idea that either one of them is controlled by a democratic secret society uh, just goes against every, uh, every piece of evidence we have ever had about the culture of uh, the FBI, federal law enforcement, or the broader intelligence community. And, and in fact, I, I, I think you would be hard pressed uh, to find a more traditionally conservative institution uh, in the United States than the FBI. Um, you know, I, I think that that, uh, and, and I say that with, with deep respect for, for the FBI, but I mean, it is, uh, it, it is a, an institution uh, you know, when Bob Mueller was the leader of it, um, he wore a white shirt every single day as FBI director because that's what J. Edgar Hoover wore every day as FBI director. I, I'm not. I'm not joking about this at all. Uh, Mueller would insist that his top staff wear white shirts because that was what the FBI did. Um, that is not exactly. Uh, the breeding ground for uh, a George Soros-led uh, democratic uh, secret society. But 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 how do you like? How did that happen? Or when you see the evolution of this, what like what do you make of it? 
Um, I, I think it's incredibly dangerous what we are sort of seeing right now. Um, and this sort of circles back around to what what you were saying at the start, which is, um, you know, Bob Mueller is an institutionalist. Um, it, and democracy relies on the strength of its institutions. This is the thing that we have as a country. We don't have a monarchy, very specifically. We don't have sort of a hereditary change of power. What we have are institutions that bind us together generation by generation. And if I can bring in my other book here for a second um, about the history of the US government's doomsday plans, um, one of the things that stood out for me when I was going back and recreating the US government's plans for nuclear war is that the government made a very conscious decision that it wasn't going to be enough to save the government. We needed to save the historical totems that have bound us together by generations. And so at the National Archives, they had a plan for saving the Declaration of Independence uh, and that they would save it before they saved the Constitution. That at the uh, Library of Congress, they had a uh, plan to save the Gettysburg Address before they saved George Washington's military commission. And that through the Cold War in Philadelphia, there was a specially trained team of park rangers whose job it was to evacuate the Liberty Bell in the event of a surprise Soviet attack. And that these are the things that make us Americans and make us America. And it's not us, and it's not any single generation, and it's not any single president or any single Congress. And that what we are witnessing right now is the public destruction and denigration of institutions that we will need in a crisis. And when that crisis arises, which it will, uh, we are going to be... Uh, sad about what we have allowed uh, the congressional Republicans uh, and the Trump administration to do to critical American institutions. Well, hot damn. <laughs> that was incredible, Garrett. <laughs> Tear to my eye thinking about the power of the, of the symbols in our democracy and the power of our institutions. We have time for just a couple of questions, and I'm going to privilege students here. Um, does anybody have a question? Because otherwise, I will keep going. Uh, my name is Joshua Polchek. I'm a student here. Um, I'm a student here at, at HKS. And my question is, what do you think the average American can do in this situation to try to protect these institutions? And corollary to that, what do you think the people in this room who have some extra privilege and I think responsibility that comes with it can do. I think the challenge and the unknown that we are in right now is there is going to come a moment in Bob Mueller's investigation where we as a country have to decide whether facts matter. And we don't know what those facts are going to be, so that becomes a very hard, abstract idea uh, to, th to sort of think about how we as a country are going to react. But I think uh, there is going to come a time where uh, and, and we have already seen it, by the way, happen four times in this investigation already, where Bob Mueller has information that he is able to, that he feels comfortable uh, taking to a U.S. court of law, and that he feels that he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that X and Y and Z have happened. And to the extent that we as a country uh, decide that facts matter and take whatever action it is in whatever that moment is to support facts, I think is going to be the ultimate test of how this case uh, and our institutions will uh, survive it. Hi, Howard Cohen, a second year graduate student here. What, do you, what kind 
of interference do you expect to see, if any, in the midterm elections, and what do you think the U.S. can do about it? First is, uh, we, we are nowhere close to where we need to be in securing uh, our election infrastructure. Um, and uh, it, the good news, bad news is our election infrastructure is so confusing and antiquated that at, at scale, it, it's going to be incredibly hard for a foreign entity uh, to uh, affect. The bad news is, in 2016, we just worried about Russia. Every other foreign adversary that the U.S. faces, uh, from nation states to transnational groups, is looking at the midterm elections now, saying, uh, oh, I have some new ideas. And uh, do you think the FBI is prepared for that? Uh, no, and it's not the FBI's job. Um, it, it's DHS's job, which is sort of a separate challenge, um, which is that e even if tomorrow DHS decides it is going to drop SWAT teams into all 50 states to lock down every aspect of the election infrastructure, uh, DHS capacity-wise, manpower-wise, could probably do four. Um, and I think that sort of part of the question then is sort of what are, what are the cyber goals internationally of other adversaries? Um, and, and that becomes sort of an interesting, challenging question, which is if I was China, um, the the sort of second best cyber power in the in the world right now. Um, I don't know exactly what I would probably want to do to the midterm elections, um, but I would be thinking about that really hard. I don't know whether I'm trying to support Republicans or trying to support Democrats. Um, and, and this is this is sort of ultimately why I think that the Republican uh, parties sort of head in the sandness of the election interference is so troubling and so strange is there's no guarantee Russia is coming back on your side in the 2018 midterm elections. Vladimir Putin has a very specific set of goals that Vladimir Putin understands very well, which is that he wants to exploit the seams in Western democracies uh, to weaken them, uh, not not because he feels that he can build Russia up, he can't, for a variety of economic and demographic reasons, Russia is a weakening power. And so he is trying to t tear down Western democracy and destabilize it. And you see that playing out uh, across Europe and across uh, the 2016 election. If I was Vladimir Putin in 2018, I'd probably come in on the democratic side. Um, like the, the quickest way to sort of continue to undermine American democracy uh, from Putin's standpoint would be to continue to paralyze the American government going forward. Um, and, and so I think that's a calculation China's making, that's a calculation Russia's making, uh, Iran's making that, North Korea's looking at that. Um, and remember, uh, and, and I, I, so the story that I was chasing in the last 10 days of the election was not about Russia. It was about the Mirai botnet, um, which we've sort of forgotten now, but was this massive network of Internet of Things devices that had been hijacked to launch denial of service attacks on US websites. This is, uh, it was that Friday right before the election uh, in October 2016, where like the internet shut down on the East Coast, if you remember that. And, and it was because there had been this massive denial of service attack launched against one of the internet backbones of uh, the East Coast infrastructure uh, domain registrar named Dyn. The US government thought that that was a dry run by a nation state, probably Russia, 
uh, to bring down the nation's websites on election day. Um, you know, uh, there are all sorts of different problems that could happen on election day, none of which would fundamentally affect the integrity of the voting process. Um, you know, you don't need to actually get into a voter database. You could shut down every American looking up where to vote. Um, you could do that district by district. You could shut down uh, access to the Associated Press website uh, the night of the election and make it three days before America realizes who won Congress. Um, so uh, I think that sort of part of this just fundamental challenge is we uh, have numerous ways uh, that we are uniquely vulnerable as a free democracy uh, in our election infrastructure right now. And we're not doing anything about any of the different problems that we have with it. Uh, last question. I do want to plug this. Uh, Garrett's piece in Wired about the Mira botnet is an incredible story. And it was a FBI agent in Alaska who tracked it down. Really a hell of a story. Uh, and, and by the way, it was not Russia. It sure. was three college students uh, who were trying to... Uh, make more money at the Minecraft video game. Uh, All right, last question. Introduce yourself, please. Hello, my name is Anders Bob. I'm a uh, first year master's student at the Kennedy School. Um, you actually mentioned earlier about, uh, you literally wrote the book on uh, Robert Mueller's uh, tenure at the FBI, uh, which overlapped with 9-11. I'm just really curious as to when we think about uh, Michael Flynn or Papadopoulos, um, these are people who could be flipped into witnesses. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious about and have been. Yeah, which and, is yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm yeah, yes. Um, I'm curious about the process by which Mueller in the past has done that uh, throughout his tenure as FBI director or working as a law enforcement agent. How does that process play out? Um, how do you find something to bring somebody over to your side as a character witness to then? get bigger fish later on in an investigation. Yeah, so this is, um, this in some ways is also one of the really interesting aspects of this investigation, which is the extent to which uh, amid this incredible partisan storm, it's an absolutely typical FBI investigation in every meaningful respect. Um, the FBI, as a, a federal law enforcement agency, takes down corrupt organizations. That is sort of what it is geared to do. Um, it doesn't do street crime. It does uh, violent gangs. It does drug cartels. It does uh, mafia families. Uh, and it does public corruption uh, uh, um, schemes. And, and that's exactly what you're seeing play out here, which is an investigation that starts at the bottom and on the outside. So you go for George Papadopoulos on the lowest rung of the investigation, uh, and you go for Paul Manafort in an unrelated area. Um, and then you sort of use that pressure to work inwards. Um, and, and in some ways, uh, the, the challenge of federal law is that if you take, 17 prosecutors and 40 FBI agents and throw 10,000 hours of investigative work uh, at any organization, uh, even one that is waking up every day trying to do the right thing, you're going to come up with federal law violations. Um, if Bob Mueller's team was here uh, investigating Nico, please God, no. um, <laughs> like Nico goes to jail. Um, and, and I don't know for what, but like at some point, like you stumble into problems. He's literally wearing a wire. <laughs> and that this is where, this is where the federal government just ends up with an incredible amount of investigative leverage. Um, and you see this actually even in the way that these indictments are written, um, which is you, if you go back and you read the Paul Manafort and the Rick Gates indictments, uh, there is an incredibly detailed list of asset forfeiture uh, for Paul Manafort. And the Rick Gates section is sort of TBD. Uh, so I would imagine uh, one of the things that we are 
seeing sort of play out, we think, is that Rick Gates is sort of moving towards cooperating with uh, Mueller's investigation. And I would imagine that that cooperation uh, deal uh, began something along the lines of the FBI sitting down with Rick Gates' lawyer and saying, real nice house you have, Rick. Um, would be a shame if Uncle Sam ends up uh, auctioning it off um, you know, from the front steps of the courthouse. Um, anything you want to tell us about Paul? Um, and that that is, uh, that's, uh, that's just sort of how these investigations unfold. And that's how you start at the bottom of a mafia family and end up getting the godfather at the end. That's how you start with street level uh, drug sales and work your way up to the head of a cartel. Um, and that's what the FBI does, and that's what Bob Mueller is sitting there very clearly doing right now. Well, Garrett, I could listen to you all afternoon. You really are an inspiration in your reporting. I highly recommend uh, his two most recent books, Raven Rock and The Threat Matrix. I also recommend he wrote a book about Mark Warner's first run for president called The First Campaign, which I suspect could be relevant again in 2020. <laughs> and um, I, I just want to really be grateful for your time with us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. So we will see you um, But the country's that have done the best, and I think that there is a lesson for Russia in this, uh, should, uh, should Russia ever be able to avail itself of it. Uh, the countries that have done the best, the best in the post-Soviet uh, space are countries that have been able to create a new narrative, right? And the narrative uh, is a narrative that others a lot of the history, right? It basically says, we were occupied. We didn't do this to ourselves. There was an occupying power that, that did this.